goes to... After JFK was assassinated, a cottage industry appeared to spread out landish theories about what really happened. Real researchers like Penn Jones, Sylvia Meager, Harold Weisberg were suddenly snowed under by crank leads and rabbit holes leading nowhere. These efforts were only magnified when Jim Garrison began investigating the case in New Orleans. Most of this gunk was manufactured by Discordians, who had been captured into a CIA counterintelligence operation designed to neutralize the real researchers. Much of this gunk also involved MK Ultra mind control theories, something few had any clue to in the mid-60s. Mind control became a subject pervaded with disinfo, starting with the first books on the subject. We were controlled by Lincoln Lawrence, followed swiftly by Operation Mind Control by Walter Bauert. Lincoln Lawrence turned out to be a regular on the emerging UFO circuit named Art Ford, who claimed to have discovered a ray gun at the North Pole that was over 100,000 years old. Most people thought this artifact looked like a toy pistol. Ford's book claimed Oswald was a KGB sleeper agent and had been set up as a patsy. He claimed the real story was published by a Chicago publisher who turned out to be Novel Books, which was Carrie Thornley's publisher as well, which should tell you all you need to know about this rabbit hole. Thornley's editor at Novel was Louis Lacey, who would later be ordained as a Discordian Pope. Surely this is the most dubious distinction any JFK researcher can hold. Who would fund the rise of a fake religion dedicated to spreading fake news about the JFK assassination? The answer is James Angleton. Bowart is an even more interesting character. An orphan from Omaha, Nebraska, which means he likely could have resided at Boys Town, the most famous Catholic orphanage in the world, Bowart moved to New York City in the early 60s and in 1965 became a founder of the East Village Other. He married Mellon heiress Peggy Hitchcock, whose brother Billy funded the spread of orange sunshine around the globe. The marriage didn't last very long, and Bard got several thousand a month in alimony for a few months after the divorce was finalized. Bard created a publishing company in Arizona for exploring metaphysical topics. Decades later, Boys Town emerged as a center for MKUltra child sex slave recruiting. Like many in the alternative media, I originally mistook Bowart for an honest researcher, but later in life I happened to pick up his book and went through a painful reevaluation, started by a short list of influencers given credit in the opening pages for shaping his zeitgeist. I was startled to see this list begin with Chip Berlay, an obvious intel propagandist who was head of Friends of Albania in Chicago while also serving as an FBI informant. Berlay would go on to lead the pushback against the emerging conspiracy research community, claiming those who believed the CIA killed JFK were suffering from a mental disorder he labeled conspiracism. Also on the list was British intelligence super spook William Stevenson, the man who ran the world's largest propaganda campaign in history from his offices on the 35th and 36th floor of Rockefeller Center. Also on the list was Fletcher Prouty, a backstop pretending to be a whistleblower. To unravel counterintelligence operations, one only need identify a spook, and before long, more will reveal themselves, because these operations involve teams with budgets that can outlast and outwit real investigative researchers. Today we have the phony QAnon community as the modern update on Discordians. But the impact is the same, which is to muddy the water on real deep state investigations. Mind control was a deep CIA secret, part of the family jewels, which is why a cottage industry appeared to plant rabbit holes on this subject. Oswald likely went through some behavior modifications. We know he was hypnotized while serving as a cadet in the Civil Air Patrol. One thing that stands out, orphans and those without strong father figures seem to make the best subjects. Louis Angel Castillo was imprisoned for robbery in Border Town Reformatory in New Jersey, another site documented as conducting MKUltra experiments. Raised in Puerto Rico by Cuban nationals, he left Puerto Rico to attend school in Cuba in 1960. He was trained for several years as a Cuban intelligence agent. 
In late 1966, he changed identities with a Filipino living in Chicago at the direction of the Cuban Intelligence Service for the purpose of going to the Philippines. Castillo departed Chicago for the Philippines, traveling under a Philippine passport, taken from a Philippine national legally. Apparently, his mission was to assassinate Ferdinand Marcos, who was dipping his fingers excessively into the stolen gold stashed by the Japanese after World War II and recovered by Yale Bonesmen working with Opus Dei. Marcos was getting kickbacks for contributing soldiers to aid the war in Vietnam. Once in the Philippines, Castillo was arrested by security services and claimed to be a Castro secret agent and offered his services in assassinating hunk guerrillas. But then they decided to submit Castillo to drugs and hypnosis, and an entirely different story popped out. He quickly confessed to being among 14 Cuban intelligence agents who had been deployed in Dallas for Kennedy's assassination, after which he flew to Chicago in a plane piloted by a Russian-looking woman named Jean Dole of Madison, Wisconsin. It appears Castillo could have been a shooter or a backup patsy linked to Castro if anything went south with the Oswald as lone assassin scenario. One of the assassins, John Rosselli, would float the theory that a CIA team was sent into Cuba to kill Castro, had been turned by Castro, and sent back to kill JFK. In a sense, this is what happened, only the team was not turned by Castro. Castillo claimed to have been positioned on the second floor of the Dal Tex building with a rifle in his lap that he had no memory of firing, a detail that could have easily been hypnotically erased. Also of note, Castillo claimed the rifle was produced out of a bag in two parts, which corresponds to Ed Hoffman's testimony of the grassy knoll gunman, as well as Joseph Miltier's description of the weapon. Apparently, Castillo had been part of the Bay of Pigs invasion and later deployed into Castro's intelligence services and recruited into the JM Wave Castro assassination plot before landing in Chicago. The CIA put immense effort into locating people who were easy to hypnotize and used them for a variety of ops, and Castillo pioneered a list that now includes Sirhan Sirhan, Mark Chapman, John Hinckley, and Donald DeFreeze. The problem was Castillo had so many multiple personalities, it became exceedingly difficult to determine which statements might be true, as opposed to those hypnotically planted. Castillo was visited by a World Health Organization-based doctor, claims Victor Orsega, who tried and failed to re him. Lifetime and Post correspondents interviewed him while warning him to shut up. In 1968, Castillo returned to the U.S. on charges of mistress and vagrancy and entered an Illinois federal jail. But his wife, and soon-to-be ex, swore he never spent a day in jail. Within a month, the Illinois governor pardoned Castillo. The last time he was seen, his mother was told Lewis was shopping for clothes and travel stuff, preparing for a missionary trip to Angola. (laughs) 